Welcome to For All to Hear. This was a project that I launched in the summertime and my goal was to make a platform available for singers who identified as Indigenous, Black or people of colour to have a place and a platform to reflect on their experience in the arts and they could react in any way they liked in an interview format or by creating a piece of art, singing a song, telling a story. But I was looking for a way for us to hear more from people inside of the opera industry who represent often what we find now to be marginalized voices. And mm. so I was unbelievably delighted when I reached out to this particular singer who responded to, I think, a Facebook message asking for her email. Um, I would like to introduce a wonderful soprano who sang with Pacific Opera several years ago, um, Delcina mm -hmm. Stevenson. Would you uh, like to share with us a little bit about how you came to be in Victoria? You know, I'm not sure who, I don't think it was through my agent. I, I'm, I'm, that's, now that I am not sure of, but I do remember that I was delighted because I, uh, I got to do Tosca with your company and I got to, well, the first time was uh, Butterfly, so. That was so you did, you did two engagements, I, you got I, a return. I, I got a return, which was great. Yeah. That is always really good. So <laughs> Madame Butterfly first and then a Tosca. And then the Tosca. And um, the Tosca, I was not so sure about uh, doing because I, I remember um, auditioning for the Met at one time and everybody thought I was going to win that. And I came in second and Bing, who was, you know, on the... Um, I call it entendant, I'm thinking of German, that's not the word. But anyway, he came to me and he says, why would you sing that aria? And I said, because it's a beautiful aria and I can sing it. He said, but you'd never do the role. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got offered this role, I, I really thought back on those words, you know, but it's a smaller house and, and I am a spinto, so, so it worked fine. And when was but, this? This is in the early 80s, is that, do I recall this? Yeah. Oh, here it is. 83. 83, 1983. Yeah, that's when, the, that's when I have a, from a newspaper. So is it, yeah, 1983. Oh, wow. Yeah. Long you, time ago. Huh? A long time ago. <laughs> Do you have any particular memories of Victoria from that time? I mean, it's, uh, we are, you know, we feel pretty unique here in our little island. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a beautiful place. And I remember that. I remember us, uh, us, uh, I always get her name wrong, uh, staying with the- Sa Carol Sa Sabiston. Er, Sabiston, yes. And, and it was such a wonderful experience. They were such a great uh, family and a great to, to, to stay with. And another thing I really write, because we've never talked about it, but I, when I did the Tosca, I was delighted to do it. So I learned it all and you know, got, to, got there. And finally, on two or three days later, they showed us the, a stage, you know, and, and at what it was going to look like. And I thought, oh, steps, you know. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, what now what's going to happen here? And they said, you know, this is where you jump, you go up, you run up the steps and you jump off. You know, I said, I, I, I can't do that. <laughs> because I, I mean, I was so, I mean, I'm, I'm still afraid of heights, you know. So I, I mean, and they said, you have to do it. I mean, this was like, a week into the rehearsals I mean, it was so <laughs> and, and I said no you have to think of some other kind of way you know well she, I mean it's, it's in the music she has to jump off the wall right they had to hire somebody I don't know Timothy right probably remembers this they hired somebody to who um, uh, I mean he gave me all kinds of uh, uh, exercises to do <laughs> and hypnotized me and all kinds of things I did it but I'm telling you it was really touch and go there for a while <laughs> these are the things you see we never think about for opera singers we think about no. you standing on stage and singing right. the but we don't think about the fact you have to jump off a parapet <laughs> and it was i mean you know it was really very high and i think they had one of those um uh, sports uh uh mats or something what you know and when i jump you know <laughs> oh god and they wanted me to go this way and i said no i'm just going <laughs> I remember that was oh yeah I had forgotten about that he probably remembers <laughs> I'll have to ask him about that. ask him yeah that would be interesting yeah, yeah. so it was a, it was a quite um, 
I, you know, we, it, it, it came out fine. Nobody knew the difference, I guess, except for the people that I had to work with, you know, but I really was quite frightened. (laughs) I was, yeah, I was really quite frightened. I really was, but, but I just had so much, and I love your gardens, the Bucharest gardens, Bucharest gardens, and just everything about it. I wouldn't mind living there, tell you the truth. It's a beautiful place to be. It is a lovely place. Mm -hmm. Uh, Tell me, where did you grow up and how did you get into music? Well, I am from Coffeyville, Kansas, but I, I was not born in Coffeyville, Kansas. My mother went to Fort Scott, Kansas to be with her mother to have me. And then, you know, a month later, I'm back down in Coffeyville. Grew up in Coffeyville and uh, started taking, she was a, a piano teacher. She also sang when I was 13, 12 or 13, I played for her. In churches, she did uh, like spirituals and that sort of thing. She had a lovely voice. And um, I thought when I went to uh, college that I was going to be a pianist, you know, and I, but I didn't realize that I had to practice like six or seven hours. <laughs> you know, I'm from a little town in Coffeyville. I'm probably the only one who played, not the only one, but I mean, you know, and I, I didn't know anything about practicing six hours, seven hours a day, you know. <laughs> So when I got there, um, I was majoring in piano, I thought, and then it dawned on me, oh, this, no, this, this will never work. So I, I but I, at, when I was, uh, uh, my senior year in high school, uh, they, I, I've done a lot of firsts, you know, the first black to do this, the first black to do that. I was the first one who was in the choir at my high school. And, and the, the, the guy there told me that, you know, I should sing, I should be a singer. So when I did go to college, I majored in piano, but I took voice sort of as a second uh, choice. And one day I walked into to, uh, my voice teacher and I said, I'm, I'm so sad. I don't think I can be a pianist. You know, I think I have, she said, well, you should be a, you should be a, a, a singer anyway. You should be a vocal, you know, this should be your major. And at that time, Leontine Price, that was the first time I heard of anybody being, you know, an opera singer. So right. it started from there. But I, I, I did a little work in college and then there were about six years that I didn't do any opera at all. So uh, until I came to L.A. and that's when it all started because there were more chances in L.A., you know. So in the college choir, that was the first time they had allowed black singers into the to, choir. To sing the sing. choir as well, yeah. Mm-hmm. And I uh, sang for the <laughs> conductor there. His name was Swarthout. Uh, he had a famous uh, niece, I think, who was an opera singer. But I was singing a spiritual. Every time I sang this spiritual with the choir, he would cry. And I, at first, I, <laughs> I didn't know why, but uh, they said, oh, you know, you know, it just, it touches him in the in his heart so well that's a sign you're supposed to be a singer for sure if you can touch people in the heart I I suppose I didn't (laughs) think of it that way (laughs) yeah you thought that maybe he was crying because it wasn't good you're right exactly (laughs) no it's because it was beautiful Uh, how did it impact you growing up in the midwest in a time when there was segregation do you have any remembrances of what that felt like it you know I I don't the only thing I remember is that when I was in high school too um, they had used to have those state con, con contests for the women's clubs would have a state contest. And my senior year, I was allowed to go with everybody else, all the white students, uh, to Wichita, Kansas, which is about a hundred and so many miles away. And I was the only one that got, got, a, I got first in all the things that I did, you know, I was the only one that got first. But when we were coming back and we stopped in a, ho- in a, a restaurant, uh, everybody else was served on plates and they, gave me, they came to me with a paper plate. And um, the, I remember the, t- the teacher, he was just, he was just mortal. <laughs> he was so, uh, you know, and he said, well, we're not going to stay here. He, I have to give him that credit. He did say, we are not going to stay here if she, if she can't be served. But, you know, when I think back, you know, I, I'm, should be rejoicing because I'm, you know, I've just won a wonderful prize. And I think the prize money was $500 or something like that, which was a lot in those days, you know, for, Mm -hmm. for me. 
And that's, but that's about the only thing I really remember about that. But it is, it's such a strange clash. It's really hard. It's hard for me to sit here and imagine what that's like to be fed in, yeah. to be the winner, to be glorified. And yeah. Not to be served in a restaurant. Not to be served. Yeah. It's a really. It's jarring. You know, yeah, it is. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, uh, I, I had some talks, talks with some of my colleagues and they were saying things that happened and they, they didn't happen to me where they would do certain roles or something and they'd have to lighten up their makeup or they have to do something to their hair or, you know, something like that. I never, I, I didn't have that experience, thank goodness, but, but it does exist. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's talk then onward from Kansas. You go to mm -hmm. LA, which is an, a very different experience, of course, California, a different, different. part of the United States. Tell right. us a little bit about your time in Los Angeles and what happened with your career there, because you're at San Francisco Opera, I believe, eventually. Yeah, yes. yeah, I, I, uh, I, I go to uh i got married and i go to la i don't know anybody and all of a sudden i uh, i meet my uh a woman that i who i had known it at my university of kansas she, she was a house mother for one of the sororities and uh and then she tells me that she has someone who oh i have i, I have a real dear friend and she works for a woman who who's an who is a teacher and I think you can get, because I didn't know, not one person, you know. So uh, we, we go to visit her, and it's Madame Kodowski, who uh, uh, was a very well-known accompanist, uh, and she has been a teacher for many accompanists at that time. Uh, and she played for everybody at that time. A lot of concert singers would come through Los Angeles, of course. And she played for everybody that came on all those, you know, the big stages. And it was her. And so she just took me under her wing and, you know, I met Madame uh, Lehman, Lottie Lehman, and my, uh, my teacher was, who wrote a lot of books, William Bernard, and uh, he was, a, he was a president of, I think, uh, vocal teachers or something, you know, <laughs> just everybody, you know, it was just uh, uh, incredible. And, and so then that's when I started singing for contest because that's the only way you become then you could become known so i sang for uh san francisco opera and i won that finally you know and um uh, uh and then i i went to their western opera and and that's where i got most of my training for opera because i i had never done any any opera really so i'm here i'm almost 30 years old by that time you know I'm, and i'm i i you know I've been singing, but not, not opera, which is totally different, you know. So you were in San Francisco in what is really a golden era, obviously, of mm -hmm. the kind of guest artists that were coming through the house and uh, Mr. Adler, who became, of course, the name associated with the Adler program, which is, you also call it Western Opera Theater, which is a really elite uh, training program. Mm -hmm for young mm -hmm. opera singers. It really bridges people into the professional it really does. world. Yeah. What was your experience of Mr. Adler? Well, Mr. Adler, uh, he, he was really unique, I think, during his time because he thought at that time that, that you had to do, if you wanted opera to succeed, it should be done in the language of the people that were listening. You know, because he was from, yeah, he was from- I didn't know that. Yeah, that's why he wanted, and, and we had, uh, he had, let's we'll see, we did Cozy Fun Tutti. We did uh, The Old Maiden of the Thief. Well, that's already English. Uh, we did uh, what is it, Barbara Seville. And they were all translations, beautiful translations, you know. And, we, and so when we would uh, sing, I remember singing in one. Uh, we did the Boheme, too. That was translated, too. And I remember this woman, she said, you know, I never knew that Mimi, when she sings this aria that she's talking about sewing. <laughs> it sounds Just more, run. it sounds more fancy in Italian instead of yeah, about right. sewing. <laughs> <laughs> what is she really doing? You know? And so he really believed in, he really believed in the, um, uh, having the language, you know, and we, and we used to, I guess, go around nine o'clock and get through at four. We had diction, we would have, uh, the stage, all kinds of uh, movement on stage, and just 
singing, all kinds of, uh, it was a wonderful experience. And I was there for two years. For, for two years. Yeah. He really believed in you, I believe, yes? Yeah, he did. Yeah. And he, what did he do for you? <laughs> well, the thing, We're special. For, <laughs> the thing he did for me, which, you know, is that I was, at, I, I was older and uh, I think the, the cutoff age was 28 or something like that. So he moved it up to 30. <laughs> I don't know what it is now. I think it's, I think it's probably still 30, you know, but. You made but a permanent for, change in it. I love that. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so I won that when I won it. I was at the age, I mean, age limit. You know, I couldn't go any more, any more years. So, so I won that. But he really was um, uh, very, very um, instrumental in my, in fact, I was supposed to sing. I sang in for two years and then he wanted me to sing, uh, start singing with like, I think he wanted me to do Mick, Mick, uh, um, what's it in Carmen? Oh, Michaela. Michaela, yeah, Michaela. Yes. And I had an accident, uh, a car accident, and I, my face was all, <laughs> my face, and they wanted me to come and audition. I, I can't, I can't, I can't come. I'm not coming like this, my face. I think I had 16, 16 stitches in my lip. <laughs> oh, it was horrible. It was a ter terrible time because I really, I really did want to do it, but I, you know, he said, well, if you don't come in, if you don't come in audition, you can't get the role, you know, they were real. I think they thought I was trying to be what, whatever, I don't know, but I wasn't, I was really, I, you know, I was really, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, so, so that, so then I so, I, so then I went to, to uh, Europe, and so that, uh, that was okay. You know. So before I go to Europe, I think I just want to grab from, um, I think I just want to grab onto both um, Leonton Price and what it oh, means for mm -hmm. you to have a role model finally, someone yeah. who looks like you who's singing, mm -hmm. um, and also maybe how that impacted casting for you and whether or not oh, you're expected yes. to sing the same I, roles then as Leonton Price, because there were not, I'm just trying to think how many black singers there would have been at that point working professionally and how that impacted yeah. casting. But let's start with Leonton Price and what that meant for you to actually see a black woman successful in opera. Yeah, well, I, I, uh, it, it meant a lot to me because when I was in, in college, I mean, when my teacher said that, I, I was not really sure that, well, uh, there was Marian Anderson, but she never, at that point, she had never sung any opera. And, uh, but before they let Leontine Price sing in the opera. They gave, uh, I think she did uh, uh, Eureka. Uh, what's her surname in Don oh, Carlos? Ulrika. 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 And she did that role um, uh, before they let <laughs> Leontine's. And I think that's the only thing she said. Uh, Don Carlos, Abelie. I got to catch myself. Abelie. Ulrika's in Trovatore, I think. Well, maybe or... that's what, maybe it was Trovatore. <laughs> You're going to have to. Maybe it's, uh, or... I mean, it was a, like a witch. It was like a... a That's almost like, all mezzo roles. <laughs> it's a mezzo role, yeah. yeah. It's a mezzo almost role, always yeah. witches, yeah. Yeah, and so yeah, that, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> so they let her, and, and I had, my mother had taken me to see Mary Anderson. Uh, she came to Joplin, Missouri, which was like 70 miles from Coffeyville. We, Coffeyville was right on the corner of, of uh, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. And I never had been in either one of those <laughs> until we went. We were right on the edge. I mean, you know, the Ozark Mountains are right there. It's a beautiful little city. And, uh, but anyway, she had taken me to see uh, Marion. So I had, I had seen her. And we had to sit up in the balcony when we were there, you know, couldn't sit in the audience. But my mother was very good about taking us to anything that came near near uh near Coffeeville, but we didn't go to Oklahoma and we didn't go <laughs> we didn't go to Arkansas but we would go any place in Kansas you know so uh when when I saw uh when 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 it was known that Leontine was going to be singing in the opera then I I sort of thought oh that is a poss maybe that's a possibility um I at that point I had not sung any opera my senior year when I graduated, when I was graduating, we did, uh, there was a little, uh, uh, my school always had a, a musical, you know, 
uh, the music school would always do a big opera or something. So this particular time they did, uh, I can't think the name of it, but I did the small, small role of a, of a maid, you know, so I was able to sing the maid, but um, I probably, I, I was, I know I was good enough to sing the lead role, but you know, I didn't get that. So that was the last opera that I did because then I, I got married and, and had my son. And then we moved to LA. So it was, um, it was uh, quite later on that I started opera again. That's why I was so late getting, you know, getting into the, to the opera, uh, you know, get, get business, business I guess I should yeah. say. Game yeah, game, business. whatever you want. I don't know what I want to call it. <laughs> Well, I'm also thinking at that time, um, you know, it's just there was so little accommodation made for children, having children, uh, women's decisions to have children. That's still something that female performers yeah. worry about, about when to have a child. And I think it exactly. says a lot about how talented you were and also and how Mr. Adler treated you to make that possible. Because to make it possible. Yeah. I don't think there were a lot of women with children probably singing and i think you're right because i remember madam layman saying uh something to me and she was very frank about everything oh it's a pity you have that child she <laughs> but you know when you think about it uh, most of your really famous singers you know like leontine uh grace bumry I, I i don't know about many white singers but black singers were never married they never had children i mean they they really just, you know, Jesse Norman, people yes. like that, Kathleen Battle, they don't, they've never married. They were just able to work on their career. And, you know, I, I remember one time, the first time I went to Europe to audition, um, I hadn't heard, I hadn't heard from any of the houses. It was more difficult. By the time I went, it was more difficult for singers to go to Europe because they didn't have as many jobs openings as they had after the war, you know, because of if course. a German can do the work, they get the job, you know. So when I was there, I, uh, I, I remember talking to my son and he was not having a good time. I think he was with his father. Can't remember. Anyway, I said, I have to go back home because I, I just could, I just couldn't, and I couldn't see bringing him to Germany at that time because I did have friends who were there and they had sons who were not doing too you know, I mean, it's uh, at that time there was still that friction between the Germans and and especially black men. Uh, I think maybe the black women have a better time of it, but uh, there was still that. So I didn't want to bring him into that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I came back home. I just, you know, and then I remember my girlfriend called me. Such and such an opera company's called you, everybody. I said I cannot come there now. You know, I just I, this was part of the part of the life, you know, couldn't do that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm curious about what the European idea of casting was, if you were a black soprano there in those years. And are we looking yeah. at, are we in the seventies now? I think we're in the seventies maybe. This is, yeah. Mm -hmm. we're in the seventies now. Yeah. Yeah. And knowing yeah. that they've always had a pretty tight Fox system, right? Uh, about, yes, yes. And how yes. you have to look and what you get to sing. How right. did that impact your career development when you were there auditioning? I think, well, it was, um, you know, they wanted me to do, sing the Aida. I, I was a uh, lyric soprano. I had, I, le I leaned into spinto because my voice was a little heavier than an average lyric, but it still was not big enough to do the Tosca. They wanted to do Tosca. They wanted me to do Don Carlos. They wanted, you know, uh, some of the things in uh, uh, Wagner, which was way out of, way out of line, you know, and, and I, I, I uh, they would never, I was a Mozart singer. I mean, that kind of voice. And they were not to, no. I mean, I would not, you know, I'm sure I would not have gotten too many roles with that. Even if I got in the house, I don't, I would not have done those roles, you know, mm -hmm. so. So what so. happened to you in your, obviously Europe didn't open up as a performing place, but you did live there for a time. So what did you- Yeah, I lived there, yeah. Europe? I lived there for 12 years. I went there the second time. And uh, by that time, when I auditioned, I was a little older. And uh, that was in the uh, 80s, late 80s, early 90s. 
And, uh, but I, so I started teaching because I found someone who wanted me to teach in their schools. So I stayed there for 12 years and had, uh, I, I did all kinds of, I did all kinds of concerts myself. And then I organized, I had some uh, Germans who wanted to, they love spirituals. They love uh, American music. They love Broadway. And so we did all kinds of, uh, I mean, I, I started conducting, which was new to me, which I had never done before, but, <laughs> but it was fun. And, uh, um, and, and I had, it was called the Stevenson Singers and they, and they, <laughs> we sang all over uh, Southern, Southern Germany. So it was a, it was a fun time. So. I love that you became an entrepreneur and created your own work, which is always <laughs> a powerful thing to do as a musician. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Always in music, but yes, right. And you had your son with you at this time? Or is no. He, he's grown no, he up was and in, he's living his own he, life. He was in college, yeah. 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 So you were able to go with him. So when he went to college, I said, okay, it's my turn. <laughs> that makes sense to me. Yeah. So I moved to, I moved to when he went to uh, Arizona, uh, I moved to New York. And I was there for eight years in audition. And that's when I, you know, 83, I think was, um, I came to Pacific. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, and then I did opera to, to, you know, Utah, Arizona, all the, all the companies, I think in Seattle, Port, uh, Portland. Um, yeah. I mean, so, I, you know, I had that from, from about, 80 to 88 and then I moved to uh, Europe in 80 the latter part of 88 and stayed I came back in 2002. Would you be willing to share uh, the story that you shared with me earlier about I think what we're called a reverse um, color casting uh, with an Otello experience you had? <laughs> yes I was called one morning I woke up it was about nine o'clock and this age, agent called me and he said, uh, do you know Otello? And uh, do you sing Otello? And I said, well, not really. I said, you know, I know the first act. I've studied the first act. And I know that I had auditioned with the Ava Maria, the aria at the end, many, many times. And I said, but other than that, I don't, that's it. He said, okay. So he hung up. So about an hour, an hour and a half later, he says, do you think you could, Seeing that, and he said, and he said, I'll tell you what's happening. San, uh, San Diego Orchestra, um, are they the Philharmonic? I can't remember. They are doing, they have all of these Met singers who are doing a concert version of Otello. And the Desdemona was Teresa Strada. No, he said, no, he said the, the, the Otello was, I think it was Vickers. John and I Vickers, said, Canadian yeah, John Vick, Yeah, yeah, John Vick. I said, and he said, I said, oh, well, then who is the best name? <laughs> he was a big, scary man. Because if, yeah, because I thought, if he's singing that, then who is the soprano, you know? And she said, Teresa Stratus. And I thought, oh, my God, <laughs> you know? And I said, I don't know. I said, I know the first act and I know the last, the, 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 uh, you know, the aria is at the end. That's it. I don't have never looked at anything. I have the score, you know. So he hangs up and about 11, 30, 12 o'clock, he says, can you throw a gown in, the, in, the, in your uh, suitcase and come up here? You might be able to sing that, you know. He said, maybe they'll make arrangements. You have to audition, he said, though, for John Vickers. And I said, oh. Oh, goodness. But anyway, I get myself together, go down to uh, San Diego, and they pick me up, and, and I go, and I have to sing for, for John Figures. And he says, oh, okay, let's do it, you know. And <laughs> so there I am, you know, I'm singing, and it was, it was really, um, they, they took my, my, I remember they took my gown, you know, out of the thing, they had to take it to a cleaners and have it, <laughs> have it pressed. <laughs> and, um, but, but he said, he, the conductor said, well, you know, if we have to stop, we'll have to stop. I said, because I really don't know anything about the second and third act. I said, I've never even uh, read through it or anything, you know. He says, if we have to stop, we have to stop. So 
I had called my husband, who was a, a conductor. He he drives down. I do the first. We do we we do the first act. But I could tell he didn't want this conductor did not want to stop. <laughs> and so my husband came at. Uh, they gave us a room, and we we're th going through the second <laughs> second act. And thank goodness, a lot of the soprano. At, uh, singing with the uh, uh, choir and, and so and I'm a good reader thank God because I couldn't have done it if I <laughs> so I just kind of followed along you know with what they were doing but I, I was able to have my book you know and 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 then of course the, the third act I mean the last act where they're Alma Maria I think I half of it I just kind of cried and yelled and screamed <laughs> What an, that's an amazing experience. That's a really intense thing to have to jump into the middle of, to not really oh, yeah. know the opera. And do you remember what it was like to sing with John Vickers? What was he like to perform with? Well, he was, he was very, he was wonderful. You know, because I think at a couple of times, you know, he, because I mean, I was so nervous. I was, I mean, it was like I was, uh, you know, and he would, you know, he'd put his armor around me, you know, and, you know, kind of like, okay, everything's okay. It's fine. You, and at the end, he was just so uh, gracious, you know. So I, I had no idea that he had this um, uh, reputation. Reputation, I really didn't know. Yeah, for being. But I he was very, scary. very Yeah. Yeah, I think they were afraid too because if he had said no, they wouldn't have had a concert. You know. <laughs> well, and it's as we talk about sort of color and the impact on a career. That's sort of an amazing story because that was, was he yeah. infamously sang a lot of Otellos and in a Moorish dark makeup. So they would always darken him. They would always darken him. Yeah. Oh, and the story is all about the fact that you know the Desdemona is white. Is white exactly. <laughs> I remember one of my uh, uh, coaches said, "I don't. This is this is a role you'll probably never do." <laughs> but. <laughs> Well, goes to show, right? Goes to show. Yeah, yeah, I got I got a chance to at least sing through it, you know, <laughs> on stage. But yeah, that was really um, that was quite a quite the quite an evening, you know. It was lovely, though. I mean, that's a beautiful that that's such a gorgeous score. I'm so glad I got to at least sing through it <laughs> in one piece, you know. It was nice, yeah. Yeah, there are those roles, there are those moments, you know, as singers, when you're on stage and you realize how lucky you are to how, be in yeah, to be. music making like that. Mm -hmm. Whether, you know, you mm -hmm. have a beautiful colleague or the symphony is incredible. And, yeah. It's a privilege. It's a privilege, yeah. And I remember that, that the, they told me, said, oh, if you do this concert, you, we'll have you come back and you'll do another concert, which they did. They had me come back and I did another. I think I have uh, both... Uh, reviews so I'll have to try to find them and I'll send them to you yeah you share them with me and we'll post them I on will. our page I will. so that people yes. can uh, now they've heard the story they'll be very curious how that was yeah right in exactly the right exactly yeah when fun. I initially reached out looking for people who wanted to respond to this moment where we're really reckoning with race in opera mm -hmm. and in many places but certainly in our industry as well mm -hmm. and you know talking about your career and places where opportunities came regardless you were a really a wonderful singer uh, places where things might have not been as successful partly because of wars timing maybe race when you look back at it do you feel like being a black woman impacted your career in a positive way in a negative way not so much I mean how do you look at it at this point in your life I look at it hmm that's an interesting question. I, because I, I was always, uh, I mean, with, with this kind of career, you know, you do one thing and you're not sure where you're going to sing. It, and you don't even know if you have a, other jobs. I mean, I guess when people are very uh, at the top, they always know maybe a year ahead or two years ahead, you know, where they're going to sing. But things just always sort of opened up for me you know, and I was always doing, I always did things that I liked doing. I don't think I ever did anything that I disliked. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think I would have, maybe I would have gotten a lot, uh, when I was in New York, I probably, uh, several people had tried to get me with Columbia, which was the top agency. Absolutely. And, you know, and they were always saying, well, we have enough, we have enough, uh, you know, singers at the time. So, so I still worked, even though I wasn't, wasn't with them. So it's sort of like a, you know, it's kind of like you have to just 
take where you are and be and be sad because I, I loved what I was doing. And like you asked me one time, what was your favorite opera? And I said, I think whatever I was working on at the time, you know, I don't think I have a, a favorite. I do like the Mozart art. I mean, because I, I, I just sort of, they just, they just sing with me. You know, I don't have to really do too much to them because they just, they just pour out of me. And I they love Mozart. So well. They fit me so well. So it was I the Mozart I, though, that in Europe, they couldn't really translate. No a black singer into a Mozart role. No, they wouldn't. No, I'm sure I would not have sung, you know, I'm sure I would not have sung. I have several friends who are, who were singers here and they never sang. They were sopranos and they never sang any, any a Mozart, you know, but they would sing a lot of new things that we don't even know about that kind of thing, but not, but not uh, Mozart. And I'm not sure how, how, because, wasn't Wagner that way, but you know, remember they, they, when I think uh, when Bumbry went, that was, she was known as the black something, you know, they had a, had a <laughs> they had, because <laughs> ordinarily a black person would not sing that role. So they, uh, what was that aria? What was that opera? I can't remember. I'll have to remember that. What's well, Norman Wright, who we really associate with, uh, Jesse Norman with uh, Sieglinda. Yeah, Sieglinda. Um, in yeah. Valkyra, right? She really, yeah, of course. I think she owns mm -hmm. that role pretty much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, 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 and Wagner, you just had to sing there. I mean, stand there. You don't have to do too much. You know, you don't have to <laughs> jump off the parapet. <laughs> no. Yeah, right. <laughs> I'm sure she didn't do that role. <laughs> oh. Irma, you've had a really, you've had such a big career. You've sung all over the world. What are you looking for opera to bring to the world at this moment? Or what do you hope would change in opera? How do you feel about what's going on in our field right now? You know, I, 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 I think I, I would love to see, uh, see how, how it would work in, in, if you had very good translations, how it would work to sing, especially, I think in Germany, I think in your big houses, they do sing the, the roles in the original language. But in all those little provinces and all those little, they always sing it in the, the German, you know. So I think it has a lot to do if you want opera to, to, to stay, I, it, you know, I don't, otherwise it'll just disappear because you have all these other uh, forms of music that these kids, um, since I, when I came back, I was teaching and it seems like people, they just want to sing uh, pop stuff or, you know, and they don't even want to take voice to tell you the truth. They don't want to do too much to do to, they don't think of building the voice to a certain uh, uh, degree. You know, they just want to sing and they want to know the music when they go to audition or something like that, you know? So I think if you, something, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, I don't know, do they, do they, do they put the uh, uh, translation over the, but that yeah. sort of takes away from the subtitle. That, yeah, no, it's a, it's a sense of removal for the audience, right? There's the split of, I have to read the subtitle and then I have to invest emotionally again. Yeah, it's yeah and that's same. hard. No, yeah, and that's difficult, you know? But, uh, but I like uh, what you were talking about when you're bringing the uh, recital back, that kind of thing, where you don't have as many people on stage. And then probably they, they can uh, uh, have more, more uh, uh, people who can, who, who, who you know, uh, composers, who will, will will make something for a smaller smaller stage and and uh, and uh, and more diverse diverse that would be nice you this know is and not and not benefit. so modern that we don't hear you know <laughs> yeah composition is changing too right in terms of yeah. the styles that we're seeing in music so that we uh, we remove some of those barriers as well you have you have a tune i have a uh you're so yeah, radical. Tune. A tune. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? <laughs> I shouldn't pick on contemporary composition. But yeah, um, tunes matter. Melodies matter in terms of an audience being able to come in and access mm -hmm. it. Uh, and I think it's, I think you're, you know, as we talked about uh, earlier, just um, recital coming back, intimacy in music, being close yeah. to the performer. Uh, there is it. value and benefit in that for an audience. I think sure. so. Yeah. Yeah. I know every, it's so funny because every time I hear, uh, Pavarotti sing uh, from uh, Turandot, the uh, Nessun Dorma. Nessun Dorma. I, 
I, I have heard all kinds of tenors sing that. Um, you know, I, it's, a, it's the most beautiful piece of music. But every time I hear Pavarotti, I have to, I mean, I just might as well get, <laughs> get the Kleenex out because I cry. I mean, it just touches me right here. It's, it, and it's the tune, I think. It's the, it's the uh, you know, you don't hear, I, I don't get that in, I, and I've sung a lot of modern music, but, uh, and I don't get that feel. Maybe it's just, be, maybe it's because I've grown up in, in feeling music and if you don't grow up in that, then you don't miss it. You know what I mean? Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Maybe. But I just, every time he sings it, I just. <laughs> I feel the same way. The puddle. You mentioned uh, that opportunity of if we move into chamber works and new composition, we might see some more diversity. You know, and the figure that I researched for our conversation comes from the Metropolitan Opera. And last year, 2019, they uh, published that they hired 368 singers. Of those, 36 were Black, but 27 of those were in Porgy and Bess. It's not a great statistic. And knowing the makeup, like the makeup of the United States or even around the world in terms of people of mm -hmm. color, Black people, Indigenous people, that's pretty tough. Um, Mm -hmm. When you teach and you're encouraging young singers to come into the arts who may not have this as part of their musical tradition, like with music they didn't grow up with, music that's not in their household, they may come from a different culture. Mm -hmm. um, what advice do you give them? Because that's a tough statistic to look at. That's, uh, that's you know, my goodness, I don't know. Um, it's, I, I try to, I, with young people, I try to get people to really listen to music because I find that when I play, if I play something for them, they, they think, oh, that is so beautiful. But, you know, like you say, they've never heard it. Uh, they have parents who don't even know. Most parent, most of their parents don't want them to be in music because they think music is not, you got to make a living, you know. <laughs> you can't just have fun, you know, and just... Yeah, it's make not a real you gotta job. Make, you gotta make money, you know. So I always try to get them basically, and, and I used to always have a, 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 a rec recorder of some kind where I would play, play things for them because they, they just didn't know, know. I think I saw something on YouTube not long ago where they had a lot of these rappers and, and, and people that, you know, they're singing now, and they have a thing. When you think about it, they're only like 20 years old. So that's this century. They don't know anybody from the other century. So they were playing things like um, uh, Nat King Cole and people, you know, people like that. And I, and I think, oh, I'm not that old. I like what I remember Nat King Cole. <laughs> but anyway, they were playing. I said, oh my gosh. This, and these rappers who said, that is so beautiful. So somebody had written in and said, I want you to play Pablo Rotti's Mason Dorma. Well, I thought, oh, oh, here we go. You know, because you know how they think of classical music. They, ooh, 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 they think we're just uh, oohing yes. away. <laughs> so I remember one of the guys said, he said, okay, you told me I should list, listen to uh, Pablo Rotti. Now I'm going to live. It better be good. I've never heard. I don't even know who he is. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> this, I mean, this alone is, you know. And that first thing he said, Nason Dorm, you know, we see that Nason Dorm, they, they, their eyes go ribbing. And one guy had to turn it off. He said, I don't know if I can go, I, I, I don't know if I can go through this because it's, it's, it, it touches me in such a, such a way. Then he turns it back on and he just, he, he just, he's, oh my God, I've never heard anything like that. So it, it, it tells me something about music that, uh, if it's done in the right, you know, that it can touch you right here in the heart. It's just, uh, I thought that was a, I mean, when I saw that, I thought maybe there's hope, you know, <laughs> you know, yeah, there is, it's very telling. I think, you know, you're really pointing towards music education so that yeah, you're able to that's actually true. communicate with people. That's true. No matter what your income level is or what your background that's is. That's true. Yeah. Because you that's never true. know who this might be for. If we start to, yeah, you're right. Available. Yeah, because that's the way I, I sort of made money when I was in Los, when I, before I went to uh, San Francisco and New York, I sang children's concerts 
and uh, you know, and I sang a lot of arias, and that's where I, where I got my experience singing the arias. And uh, Los Angeles is a really great place to for uh, classical music because they have every you know Santa Monica Orchestra, Pasadena, you just name it, Compton. Even have an orchestra in Compton; they have one. In, you know, <laughs> it, uh, there must be ten or twelve in all the little. Uh, uh, provinces, I guess you would call them in, you know, in uh, Los Angeles. So it's a nice place. I sang with every one of them, you know, so. <laughs> and because you do have to have experience. You can't, where are you going to get experience? You know, it's difficult, I think, these days for singers to get experience. Yeah, it is. It's uh, because the marketplace is very flooded, as you point to it's, all these different kinds of music. It's, uh, mm -hmm. it's competitive. And yeah. um, more singers are needing to self-produce. That's true, you know? too. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. because there's only so many opera houses. Um, I think my last question for you would be, um, are you hopeful for the future of classical music and that we will see more diversity on stage or different stories being told? Not even just performers, but, you know, different newer stories representing a wider group of the population. I think so. I think... Uh, um, I'm hoping so. I'm, I hope that that our that the people who are coming to, coming that are composing now, you know, they have other stories to tell. I think that's what's happening in the movie industry, that you know they they have other stories to tell. So they you know it's uh, and it's wide open because it hasn't they've never been told before. So I'm hoping that that's what will happen. Well, I'm grateful that you're in the world teaching and mentoring another generation because I think you're an important part of what changes what's on the stage. Because just like you I had Lee and so. Tin Price, you are <laughs> someone's so. Lee and Tin Price. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, she lives, I think she lives in, uh, I was looking at uh, something uh, uh, on the house and gardens the other day, and these people were from Laurel, Mississippi. That's where Lee and Tin is from. And they were showing these people a house, and this great big wall on this building had a picture. It's called the Leontine Park or something. And they had, they had this huge, and she had on her turban. And, <laughs> and they said, and they said, this, this woman is from Laurel, Mississippi. I said, they probably don't even know what she did, but they. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. <laughs> It's been such a delight to talk with you. I'm so grateful that you got in touch with me and agreed to have this chat with me. I'm so glad share. you got in touch with me. It's beautiful. Because it made, you know what it did? Made me think back over some of the things. And, and with this COVID, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you think, oh, gosh, now, now what do I do? You know, here I am. You know, what do you do? You got to just stay. So I've had so much, so much to do to think about. And it's been wonderful. Thank you. A great pleasure. And uh, I hope everyone's enjoyed watching this interview. Uh, feel free to write in. Maybe if you have more questions for Dulcina, you're so delightful. I might even come back to you with some more questions. Oh, that would be great. No problem. <laughs> so many good stories to tell. Uh, but I really enjoyed my time today and yeah, being able too. to share um, your life's experience with everyone. It's really Thank fascinating. Thank you. Tell everybody there I said hello. I will. Absolutely. We're going to check in with Timothy about the parapet. Yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. I, I would. I like to know if he remembers that. <laughs> Maybe they never told him. I don't know. <laughs> I may have to put that into the blog, also on the website. All right. Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Dulcina. <laughs> okay. Bye. 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 Okay. I'll. I'll. Right. So this is our bonus. This is our bonus feature moment. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we talked about. Um, Kurt Herbert Adler, um, and mm -hmm. that he, uh, he made adjustments in the competition so that you could be older and still be part of it. I think you permanently changed the age that you can do uh, the Adler right. Fellowship at. Um, but <laughs> he was also um, like a colorblind man to cast, and he was Austrian, so that is sort of surprising for the time. It was, it, it was surprising, and I, I mean, that I think about it now, I didn't, I, I didn't think anything about it at the time. But he, I did the uh, Palmina. This is a picture of. That's perfect. Yeah, we can see that. Yeah, that's a picture of my doing the Palmina, and uh, uh, I'm at Magic Flute, I guess I should say. Yeah. And I got to do Cosi Fantute. I did, and and you know we did the um, 
I had a, I did Field and Ligi, and uh, uh, Carol uh, Kirkpatrick is her name. She did the uh, Dorabella, and we were sisters. And no, I never remember, nobody ever said a word about us being sisters. You know, I mean, they just, just, uh, and, we, and we, we traveled all over from Seattle on down to LA and over to the, uh, almost what's it, next of Nevada. I don't think we went, yeah, we did. We did go to Arizona at one point because uh, Carol was from, she was from, uh, um, someplace in Nevada, I've forgotten where, she wasn't from Las Vegas, so, but anyway, uh, it, 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 he, it, I got to do, and I did me, me, and I did, uh, I can't, I was trying to think all the things I got to do with him, but he didn't, he, he, he let me do roles that I'm sure that if I'd gone to Europe, I would not have gotten to do those roles, so, that was great. <laughs> 